Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Powered 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. This is the Area 941 Radio Walensky Podcast. I'm Richard Walensky, and we're talking about books, about theater, about film, about television, and from time to time, even about KPFA, Pacifica Radio. The noted fantasy and science fiction writer Gene Wolfe died on April 14, 2019, one month shy of his 88th birthday. By the time of his death, He'd achieved a Lifetime Achievement Award from the World Fantasy Convention. He'd been acclaimed a science fiction grandmaster from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. He'd won several awards from various organizations in the field and was considered a writer's writer. And that last designation, that's important, because unlike writers like Ursula K. Le Guin or Isaac Asimov or Stephen King or even Terry Pratchett, Wolf's fame never spread beyond these genres, despite writing in a literary style and despite focusing on philosophical and moral issues in his work. Wolf started publishing late in life. His first novel, Operation Ares, was published just before his 40th birthday in 1970. But after that, his collection of short stories, The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories, and his multi-volume Book of the New Sun skyrocketed his career inside the science fiction and fantasy field. By 1982, his reputation had sufficiently cemented to be named a guest of honor at the first Baycon convention over Thanksgiving weekend. And it's there that Richard A. Lupoff, Lawrence Davidson, and I had a chance to interview him about his work and his career. The first two of the four-volume Book of the New Sun the Shadow of the Torturer and the Claw of the Conciliator, had just been published to great critical acclaim, and it seemed he was on the verge of some kind of superstardom that never quite moved outside this chosen field. The original interview was poorly recorded, so please bear with the sometimes less than satisfactory sound quality. We began the interview by asking Gene Wolfe about how he came upon science fiction and how he came to write. The first piece of science fiction that I ever read was by Theodore Sturgeon. I was interested in Wells because my father read Wells and Verne, more or less, guided me to them. Maybe I ought to start by how I got into reading science fiction. My mother bought the first paperback science fiction anthology that was ever published, which was Pocket Book of Science Fiction, edited by Donald A. Wilhite. And I had injured my leg some way. I could not ride my bicycle home from junior high school. And my mother came to pick me up in the car, and she had that book on the seat of the car. And I said, that looks neat. Can I read it when you're finished? She was a great mystery reader, and I read a lot of mysteries. After. And she said, you can have it now. I don't think I want to finish it. So with that <laughs> recommendation, I picked it up, and I thought it was terrific. And I, basically, I still do. I don't think I ever got a hint that I would become a writer until after I published 50 or so short stories and a couple of books. There's a very, very long period, I think, for most of us when we think that people like Richard Lupoff are writers, but that we are not writers. We are simply people who happen by accident to have written a few books and stories. What was your first published story? My first published story... When I was at Texas A&M, I wrote stories for what was then the College Literary Magazine. Whichever one of those came first, and I don't even remember what the titles of them were, uh, could be considered first publication if someone was a diehard collector. My first professionally published story was a short ghost story called The Dead Man that almost no one besides myself has read. Where was it published? Sir which is a magazine similar to We, Playboy, Viva, a magazine of that general type. Uh, it was a ghost story laid in India, uh, and somewhat courtesy of Rudyard Kipling. 
How did you happen to write for them? I didn't write for them. I, I wrote things I was trying to write at that time and uh, sent them around to a number of markets. I don't know how many markets uh, that story went to before Sir bought it, but probably a couple of dozen because that wasn't a magazine that I would have picked uh, first shot out of the box. Uh, I've had stories bought after 35, 40 rejections in some cases. Uh, that's because I know very little about marketing, and I knew even less when I was trying to market those stories. My first short story was in a magazine called Dude. Oh, right? yes. A T&A yeah. magazine, and it was between a T photo section and an A photo section. Yeah. And I brought it to the office where I was working at the time with computer business. I was so proud of my first published short story, and I tried to get everybody to look at it. They only wanted to look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to suggest that it's not not your ignorance of marketing that's involved, but the fact that you write with a quite distinctive voice. What what you write are not space operas or hard science or you know any of the traditional subtypes of science fiction stories. They are Gene Wolfe stories, and there's no such magazine out there as you know Gene Wolfe Adventure Monthly. Now you went on to write a number of short stories prior to. Fifth Head of Cerberus, which was essentially three short stories, or was it conceived as a novel? No, it was uh, three novellas. Before I wrote that, I wrote a probably justly forgotten novel called Operation Ares. No, I wrote The Fifth Head of Cerberus and took the Milford Writers Conference, and I met Norbert Slepiet, who at that time was a uh, the science fiction editor for Charles Scribner's son, and he said if you would write me uh, two more to go with this, uh, we would have a book, and I wrote him uh, the second story, which is a story by John V. Marsh, and sent that in, and uh, then he had the two, and he gave me a contract, and I wrote the third one, which is VRT, uh, but people have asked me, how can you do that, but actually, what you, you have imagined, a world you can lay any number of stories uh, in that world. Uh, here at the fantasy convention, uh, people have been talking about the, the world of fairy, you know, the uh, traditional, uh, more or less Celtic myth world, and uh, there must be almost an infinite number of stories that have been written, laid in that world, which is uh, the world of giants and elves and so forth. Uh, the whole Tolkien trilogy is laid in that world, and much, much, much lesser material as well. In Fifth Head of Cerberus, it's a kind of elliptical book. It's a puzzle, and it's not clear whether the puzzle is being solved there. Uh, the first part postulates that, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, here is a planet where there are human beings, and there are rumors or myths of the original aliens who lived on the planet, and it becomes clear that it's possible that some or all of these humans could very well be the aliens transmuted, or perhaps they were originally like this. And that's kind of the mystery, the puzzle of the first story. Now, the second story, which is called A Story by John B. Marsh, John B. Marsh being an earthling anthropologist going to the planet, his rendition of how that happened, or is it Gene Wolfe's rendition of John Marsh, or is it a true story, or what? Or are you being really kind of vague? <laughs> I hate to explain things that aren't specifically covered in the book, but none of the explanations that you have given are correct. Uh, a story by John B. Marsh is not actually by John B. Marsh, and it is not uh, my version of how things happened either. If we want to give away plot secrets, it is VRT, who is Victor R. Trenchard, who assumes Marsh's identity. His imaginative reconstruction of life among the aboriginal inhabitants, which is the way he thinks of them, the key, the gimmick, whatever you want to call it, of the aliens, is that they are shape changers. And they are very good shape changers. They are so good that when they become 
human beings, they are human beings. Uh, of course, the problem with that is that when you become a human being, you can no longer change shape. To the best of my recollection, you have to understand that you're questioning me about material that I wrote ten years or so ago and haven't reread in the past eight. To the best of my recollection, he is half Aborigine. Uh, his mother was a full-blooded Aborigine. His father was one of the uh, descendants of the uh, terrestrial settlers. Of course, the mother, having become a human woman, did it to such perfection that uh, her genetic structure was sufficiently altered uh, for her to conceive with a human man. Uh, if we're going to talk about shape changers, uh, what we're really talking about is changing the chemistry, the interior chemistry of the body cells. And that presumably is what uh, these people are able to do. That is what a cancer virus is able to do. And we shouldn't immediately assume that such things are uh, strictly mythical. Uh, because we haven't uh, found someone who, in our opinion, can do it. Actually, the Gene Wolfe book that I love the most is one which hardly anybody in the world loves because hardly anybody in the world has ever read it. Peace. So I've been shoving that at people for years, each of whom winds up saying, what a wonderful book. How come I never heard of it? How come I never saw it? Berkeley is bringing out Peace in paperback. That is the first paperback publication of a book that probably sold something like 1,500 copies. Of. That's a non-science fiction novel, which was written after Fifth Head of Cerberus? Or? It was written after Fifth Head of Cerberus. You could call it a fantasy novel, I think perhaps uh, better than a science fiction novel. It is, to a large extent, man dealing with the effect of story on his life and with his life as story. It is very, very much a study of human character in a, at least remotely or associationally, fantasy context. There are no flashing swords in it, and there are no werewolves, and there are no dragons. It's not fantasy in any such sense as these. And in a commercial marketplace that calls basically for action-adventure stories, a quiet, sensitive novel of character, which I think is, is one of the truly outstanding fantasy books of the past decade, has been tragically uh, over, criminally overlooked. And I'm delighted to hear that it's finally coming out in paperback. I cannot resist mentioning that we're skipping over another book, The Devil in a Forest, which I wrote between the ones that we've discussed at the Book of the New Sun. You began to work on the Book of the New Sun. How did the genesis of that come about? I... I've written a great deal for Damon Knight's uh, now suspended anthology series, Orbit, and uh, I had an idea for a story that I thought would be about a good Orbit novella. And when I got up to novella length, I realized that I, I'll do it as a novel. And when I got up to novel length of 100,000 words, so I realized now the story was really getting going and beginning to move, the preliminaries were out of the way, and so I said, I think I'll do a trilogy. And when I finished the trilogy in first draft, I discovered that the third book was, oh, say 50% longer than the first two. And uh, at this point, I asked my agent, Virginia Kidd, how about this, Virginia, suppose that I divide that third book and fill in some holes and so forth. And then we will have four books. And she said, well, that sounds great. So I went out with John Douglas of Timescape Books, and they said, Gene, you really are a great writer, but you left all these holes and loose ends in the four books. They now have the fourth one. So I said, since I can't wrap it up by adding an additional 10 or 20 pages, how about if I do a fifth book? So I may end up with a pentology, if there is such a word, a five-book series. You're listening to a 1982 interview with the late science fiction and fantasy writer Gene Wolfe, who died in April 2019 at the age of 87. It was recorded at Baycon Science Fiction Convention over Thanksgiving 
1982 in San Jose. My co-interviewers were Richard A. Lupoff and Lawrence Davidson, and I'm Richard Walensky on Arts Waves. A couple of questions. Again, the two volumes of the Book of the New Sun, which have already appeared, are very distinctive works. First of all, it's, it's hard to tell whether they're science fiction or fantasy. They take place in a remote future, and yet they have more of the feel of fantasy than science. There's no technology there. If there's anything to which they're even remotely comparable, I, I would guess that it's uh, The Dying Earth by Jack Vance, which leads me to ask uh, if Vance uh, is, is an author that you read a lot, how you feel about his work as compared to yours, or where you would place yourself in, in the spectrum of science fiction and fantasy writers on a, on a line maybe from Tom Dish at one end to Larry Niven at the other. I would say probably about three doors past the drugstore on the corner. I call the kind of thing that the, the Book of Italy's on is science fantasy. And to me, I, I wrote an article about this in The Writer, which is a magazine for writers. To me, science fantasy is science fiction which has the feeling, the atmosphere of fantasy rather than the atmosphere of technology. If you write a story about computer written from the standpoint of an engineer or programmer who works for a computer company, that is science fiction. But if you write the same story about the same computer from the standpoint of, uh, let us say, a tribesman from Yemen, that becomes science fantasy because the, the tribesman sees the computer and sees it doing its thing. That is what it is. Uh, Dick says, you know, there there's no technology. There is technology, but it's not seen from the viewpoint of the technician. These people, the people of the Book of the New Sun, uh, have interstellar travel, which we do not have. They have uh, means of reaching parallel universes, uh, which we do not have. Uh, they have uh, effective uh, laser, maser, particle beam weapons, and since it's not written from the standpoint of a technologist, uh, we don't know which ones they are. All that technology is there, but it's seen from outside because uh, this is a civilization, and there are many civilizations like this in the world today. It has access to very high technology, but which does not have the resources to educate more than a very small portion of the population in that technology. Suppose that you were the, the ruler of uh, some state in Central Africa. If you wanted to, uh, there are many people who would be happy to, buy, to sell you jet planes, but 99.9% uh, .9 of your uh, population has no idea at all what's going on in the, the jet engine or in the radio in the jet plane and so on and so forth. Now, in there, you mentioned, you just mentioned interstellar travel. I don't recall. I remember now, now the citadel that Severian originally lives in uh, was pointed out to me after I had read the first book, before I had read the second, to be a, a huge spaceship and that the entire area was just filled with these with these derelict spaceships. Is, is this correct? The Citadel is not a huge spaceship. The Citadel is a collection of interstellar ships no longer in use, which have been uh, converted to use as buildings and interspersed with uh, masonry construction, things that were never intended to fly and which is underlain by subterranean tunnels and so forth that are remains of the original spaceport. But uh, the Kakajans of the uh, book, uh, who I think are mentioned at least in Shadow of the Torture, who uh, appear much more, or I should say somewhat more clearly, uh, in The Claw of the Conciliator and still more clearly in the third book, The Sword of the Lictor, which should be out in January, are Aliens. The maser and laser technology, that's that uh, thing that they have that battle with at the end of Shadow of the Torture. What they do is to fight a duel using extraterrestrial plants. 
as weapons. And of course, since the protein chemistry of the plants is very different from the protein chemistry of life on Earth, the plants tend to be very fatal to terrestrial life. The, you were talking about laser, maser weapons, particle beam weapons. The pistol that Bodilus gives to Thea in the first chapter, I believe, the scene in the Necropolis, is a weapon of that type. I think it's the only appearance offhand that I can remember of that type of weapon in the first book. But, of course, they are around, and they come in in the, in the subsequent books uh, when required. But, again, if we, if we could take the analogy of some impoverished state, it's quite possible for a few citizens of such a state to have some machine guns or big game rifles, but most of the people are going to have spears because you don't have enough money to give uh, every second man a submachine gun or a big game rifle. Gene Wolfe is an author who deals in subtleties and ironies, complexities, wonderful uh, intellectual devices and artistic devices, which which in my opinion, Gene makes you very much of a writer's writer. My question is, how does that mass readership out there respond to you? What kind of feedback do you get? The feedback that I get is largely positive. I would guess, say, about 200 pieces of fan mail since the publication of Shadow of the Torture. I can remember one violently turned off condemnation from a reader. And the thing that bothered him, and I think it's it's very understandable, I might even be him if I were him, was the fact that he got to the end of the book and he discovered he had not gotten to the end of the story. He felt that when he bought a book, the story should be completely wrapped up in that volume, which, of course, completely lets him out as a reader of history, although he can be a reader of biography. As, I, as I've already mentioned, we may probably will do a fifth volume but even from the standpoint of the tetralogy, the four volumes, if that had been published in a single book, it would have been a book of roughly 400,000 words, and it would have been a commercial disaster. You can't publish a 400,000-word novel unless it's by Isaac Asimov or Robert A. Heinlein or perhaps Saul Bellow or somebody like that. But uh, the Gene Wolfs and the Richard Lupoffs cannot publish work of that length commercial success. Uh, why didn't you publish uh, your collection, uh, the What If collection, in one volume? I would have liked to. First of all, there would be physical production problems that would make it extremely difficult to, to publish that book, although not impossible. But the main reason is that publishing that large a book would drive the cost of it up so high that they would have to stick on a, a prohibitive cover price and it would kill sales. A uh, cartoon in the New Yorker some years ago of two elderly, wealthy-looking gentlemen in a huge shadowed private library. And one is lugging over to the other a folio volume that must be eight inches thick, uh, bound in calf with brass corners and so forth. And he says, here, Richard, here's something I think you'll like. The first two volumes of the books have come out, is Shadow of the Torturer and Claw of the Conciliator. Uh, now we have Sword of the Lictor, and following that, Citadel of the Autark. Yeah. And uh, obviously you have not thought of the title for this yet. Uh, I don't well, well, have you. Obviously I've thought of several titles and I haven't decided on one. That's, that's the problem. Uh, I only started uh, thinking about this sort of thing, really, Friday night. Perhaps I should mention that there will be a an unofficial and unannounced fifth or possibly sixth book with the title The Castle of the Otter. List of the title of the fourth book, which is, as you most mentioned, The Citadel of the Otter, as The Castle of the Otter. And I thought, uh, gee, that's a wonderful title. So a small press publisher and I are going to do about a 40,000 word book with essays, uh, if you want to call them that, little articles about the writing of the Book of the New Sun, about some of the unusual words which many, many persons have complained of in the Book of the New Sun. The uh, the only one that's unreal in there or not a, a genuine word is Artello, uh, 
or Artellos, I forget which, and that's because it's a typo. There's, it's supposed to be a Martello, and uh, the printer left the M on. Uh, all the other words are <laughs> legitimate. James Blish, if I may flash back to James Blish, who is now deceased and who wrote Black Easter and many other uh, good books, used to uh, say, don't call a rabbit a smeep, which meant don't set up an alien world and then uh, have foxes and squirrels and bunnies and give them strange names and think that you're you're doing something. And it occurred to me that uh, if something were laid on Earth, uh, there were plenty of strange names already, not necessarily for rabbits. I see no, no need to rename rabbits. Uh, you know, Oswald is a good rabbit name and bugs. But... Uh, <laughs> But for many other things, words that are, are little used but are perfectly legitimate. And uh, often I wanted to talk about little discussed but perfectly legitimate things. What is a mystese and so forth? The, the word mystery comes from mystese, not the other way around. But uh, nobody much uses that word except me. Were you specifically looking for these words as they came up? It seemed to be at the beginning I had my dictionary out, and then I figured the hell with it. The dictionary doesn't have these words. <laughs> Where did they come from? Most of them, I think. There was a problem. The main problem was getting the correct spellings. Uh, in most cases, I had big memories of having encountered these words somewhere. And I had to find some source that would give it to me correctly. I'm a poor speller at best. And when I get into unusual Greek roots, a uh, preposterous speller, correct? Uh, I use, oh, Merriam Webster's Unabridged. Actually, I have two of those. I use the uh, Concise Oxford Dictionary. I use the uh, New York Times Book of Misunderstood and Misspelled and Mispronounced Words. I use Mrs. Somebody's. I can't think what her name is. Does anybody know? A collection of Strange Words. And looking up these words, I then learned other words. And I said, gee, that's a neat word. I'll file that away in the back of my brain. And uh, I'm sure that in many cases, while I was writing, let's say, the third book, I used some word that I had encountered while I was looking for another word that I used in the first book. But there aren't a whole lot of these. It's been greatly exaggerated. The next two volumes of Book of the New Sun, The Sword of the Lictor and The Citadel of the Autark, were published in 1983 and 1984. There was also a sequel, The Earth, U-R-T-H, of the New Sun, that was published in 1987. Gene Wolfe would go on to write several multi-book novels, including The Book of the Long Sun, The Book of the Short Sun, and The Wizard Knight, along with several other novels, short stories, and essay collections. His last novel, A Borrowed Man, was published in 2015. A film version of The Death of Dr. Island was partially filmed in 2008, but has never been released. There's also a short called Dr. Island from 1999 that may or may not be the same film. Curiously, nothing else has been filmed. If you'd like to check out the works of Gene Wolfe, there's no better place to start than Shadow of the Torturer, or The Three Heads of Cerberus. You can also check out his short story collection, The Best of Gene Wolfe, which was published in 2010. My co-hosts in the interview were Richard A. Lupoff and briefly Lawrence Davidson, and I'm Richard Walensky on Arts Waves. This interview was digitized, remastered, and re-edited in 2019. Feedback on this and other Radio Walensky podcasts is appreciated. You can write to bookwaves at hotmail.com. You can listen to other interviews either as Radio Walensky podcasts or in the archives pages of bookwaves.com. Until next time, I'm Richard Walensky on the Area 941 Radio Walensky podcast. <laughs>